Here we go. He's the Shadow Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy. So not energy. Ah, uh, well, there we go. You know, first bit of fake news that you've got from Biz News ever. James Laura, I'm a Shadow Minister of Mineral Resources. He's uh, he, he comes from the most honourable profession known to mankind. Journalism, of course. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm honoured to present our speaker, Mr. James Lorimer, a distinguished member of the Democratic Alliance. His dedicated service and commitment to democratic principles have made a profound impact in South African politics. True. Talk to people in the mining industry and they'll tell you this. A strong advocate for transparency, equality, and social justice, shares that with you, Herman. Mr. Lorimer's influential voice echoes in the corridors of power, fostering constructive dialogue. Today, we eagerly await his insightful perspectives. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Mr. James Lorimer. Say this with ChatGPT, it's very nice to people. Um, yeah, on the oversold bit, I am the Minister of Mineral Resources. Um, although I sit on the Mineral Resources and Energy Portfolio Committee in Parliament, what the DA did was it divided the two, realizing that energy was as much as one person could humanly take. So that's been given to a colleague of mine, which is why I'm probably relatively more relaxed than I would otherwise be if ESCOM was my problem. So what is my problem is when stuff is in the ground, so all the mineral resources and oil and gas, while it's in the ground, it's my baby. Once it comes out, it goes to energy. Uh, um, a little, um, you know, everybody's been very good about sort of TED talking this when they've been up here, they've been chatting to people. Being a former radio newsreader and a parliamentarian where you have to make every word count, I tend to be um, more used to reading my speeches. So. Um, Apologies for that where I do, but it's a, it's a terrible habit. At the end of April this year, I wrote an article about the largely unreported goings-on in the oil and gas industries in South Africa and its neighbours. Now, it's an extraordinary story, which, as Alex said, has not received the media attention that it should, that it should have. I'm going to start by recapping what I said there. The main takeaway from the story was that South Africa has a significant oil and gas industry under development. There is huge potential... And if we play our cards right, and by we, I'm largely talking about the government, we could have a resource find on our hands that will echo the great resources finds in the past, like the Kimberley Diamonds field, Diamond Fields, the Tvardis Run Gold Field, the Whitbank Cold Fields, and the Bushveld Complex. That's an optimistic, even wildly optimistic take. But then I do rub shoulders with miners, and miners are always optimists. But I think if you listen to this, you may agree with me. So the first piece of evidence is provided by the offshore discoveries on the Namibian coast, the southern Namibian territorial waters, just kilometers away from South African territorial waters and part of the same Orange Basin geological feature. Just over a year ago, both Total and Shell, what are called super majors, the biggest of the oil companies with the most sophisticated offshore drilling capabilities, have sunk multiple successful oil and gas wells. Total has two rigs drilling, its first well, the Venus, has been appraised by a well drilled 13 kilometers from the first, but in the same field, and according to a source, has lived up to its considerable expectations. That shows the field isn't small. It is uh, um, producing at the same rate, uh, that second well is producing at the same rate as the first field. Total CEO, Patrick Puyane, says Namibia is a priority for the company. He says the appraisal drilling on the Venus find was very positive, he said, I can tell you the oil column is very big. The company aims to start flow testing offshore Namibia this month. And in September, at the end of September, we're expecting a comprehensive update from Total. Uh, probably Shell will give one at the same time about exactly how much they, they reckon they've found. So on to Shell, which is drilled not far away. It's uh, calling its successful wells after great and famous African diamonds. So, so far it's drilled the Graf, the Larona, the Yonka, and the Lesedi, and the Cullinan well is being drilled right now. Shell CEO Wael Sawan says the company has drilled four exploration wells and an appraisal in a short period. 
And uh, just as an indication of how good these, uh, these efforts have been, when you're looking for oil offshore, you usually have a success ratio of maybe one in 10. Both these companies have hit every time they've drilled. It's a good sign. So there's a reason that Namibia is currently considered one of the two hottest offshore oil drilling destinations in the world. So all of this seems to support the belief and the early estimates that the oil field we're talking about contains some 5 billion barrels of oil. That's wonderful news for Namibia. And one prediction which I found gobsmacking was that in about 10 years, the Namibian government's receipts from oil and gas will be about the same as those of Norway. So if progress continues at the rate that it is now, both Venus and Graf will be producing oil and gas by 2028. So that's Namibia. What about us? Well, the good news is, uh, through a quirk of the sea border, the closest landfall to the wells is, uh, is actually South Africa because the, the sea border goes in at an angle following the line of the Orange River. So where they're drilling, you go to the nearest shoreline and that would be around Aranyamund. And the key thing though, is that they are in the same geological feature, that Orange Basin. Now, the Orange Basin stretches all the way down the coast to south of Cape Town. There's a sort of sub-basin there as well. And the geologists tell us, don't always believe geologists. People have lost a lot of money, but these are serious geologists. They say that there's a very strong chance of finding oil all the way down the basin. That means in South African waters in considerable quantities too. So Tal has exploration uh, rights in this area down south, uh, stretching from Saldana to far to the south of Cape Town. And it's so confident that there is oil there that it is intending to drill what they call a wildcat oil well sometime next year, south of Cape Town. They reckon they're going to find oil. And when I say confident, bear in mind that these wells, which are incredibly technically complicated, can be a couple of hundred kilometers offshore and over a couple of kilometers of water cost about half a billion rand to sink just one. So when those guys are guessing, you better be certain that they, they know what they're talking about. But it is a big gamble unless you go to, to have that expe expectation that you're going to find something profitable. <clears throat> so rough expectations for the total West Coast oil fields are something around 10 billion barrels of oil. And listen to this one, 50 trillion cubic feet of gas. Uh, the best way to deal with the oil when it's that far out at sea is you put it directly onto a tanker and you take it to whatever oil refinery in the world is most appropriate. Uh, what happens to the gas, though? Uh, best thing to do is probably to pipe it to shore. Uh, it is technically compli complicated and expensive to put gas onto a tanker to carry it around the world. Profitable, but complicated. But once you have it on shore, if you're going to use it on shore, the best way to use it is to make electricity. Um, so there's a strong possibility that there'll be onshore gas available in southern Namibia and in a couple of years perhaps South Africa too. So uh, wouldn't that be nice to have gas-fired electricity at Port Nolith or Oranumont or Luderitz? So the one thing I find difficult to get my head around is how to quantify gas. Um, what's a trillion cubic feet? Consider that MOS gas, which you remember was set up in the 1980s to make uh, liquid fuel out of the shallow gas fields off the coast of Mossel Bay, produced for more than 20 years tens of thousands of barrels of fuel a day on 1 trillion cubic feet. Okay, so we're talking 50 trillion cubic feet off the west coast. Um, yeah, put it another way, 1 trillion cubic feet of gas could create 1,000 megawatts of electricity for 25 years. So that's the west coast. So let's now move to the discoveries that have actually been made in South African waters, uh, further off Mossel Bay. Uh, the, uh, what they call the Padafisi Fairway, the Brulpada and Leipat discoveries by Total, which are currently going through the process of obtaining production licenses. These two are estimated to contain combined reserves of three to four trillion cubic feet of, feet of gas and a billion barrels of oil. Now, Pendile Masangane, who's the chief executive at the Petroleum Agency of South Africa, which is the government agency that licenses uh, oil and, uh, and gas drilling, has been quoted as saying development of that Southern Cape field alone is expected to contribute up to $457 million per year towards South Africa's government revenues. These are not the only offshore oil resources that oil companies are interested in. Off the East Coast, KZN, um, the uh, Italian major oil company, ENI, uh, was very interested in looking. 
but they uh, decided to give up on their acreage after a succession of challenges by green groups. They had uh, a lot easier things going on in Mozambique, etc. So they moved off. I'll talk more about the green um, the greens in a moment. Um, now, when you say you've got oil, the charge is sometimes made that well, you know, these big international oil companies are just going to take all our stuff and exploit our resources and take all the profits overseas, and we'll get nothing. Well, that's not really true. The very rough international standard for government earnings from a barrel of oil is around 60%, sometimes in excess of that. That's through a combination of taxes, royalties, state ownership, etc. cetera. And uh, so you can imagine the amounts of, of money we're talking about for state revenues, which would be fantastic because as we all know, our finances as South Africa are in a terrible state and we could really do with some money, not only to pay down debt, but also to afford things like roads, hospitals, and schools that we really need. So that's offshore, it's a great story. Um, some people know about that. Fewer people know about onshore gas. People have heard of Renogen, a uh, great company, great success, a helium producer with a, a line, a production line of, of gas, which is already being supplied to industrial customers. Um, but there's more. There's an Australian company called Kinetico, which has been um, looking around the south of Mpumalanga for many years. And they've begun drilling very successfully. They've now drilled 40 holes. Every single one of those holes has got gas. People didn't expect this. It's a unique geological feature. There is a bit of coal there, as a, some of it may be coal bed methane, but the rest of the gas comes from sandstone. The gas that they've found is payable. The, drill, the holes drilled are only between 300 and 600 meters deep. So it's relatively shallow. Um, <clears throat> the, they reckon the gas field has a life of from 12 to, to 20 to 30 years. Uh, nobody's quite sure because it's a unique geological feature. There's nothing to model it on elsewhere in the world, but certainly the flow rates that they're measuring at the moment look very, very good. They're reckoning on another 5 trillion cubic feet of gas. And the interesting thing about Kinetico or Afro Energy as its BEE vehicle is going to be called is the location of their resource. It's a stone's throw from South Africa's power-producing heartland in Mpumalanga. So a lot of the transmission lines are in place. It's also even closer to the Lily gas pipeline, which runs from Secunda down to industries in Newcastle. So the great thing about this is if you can produce the gas, it's on site where it can be used. They're seeing potential customers for that gas as being customers of the Lily pipeline. They could, go, they could feed straight into that or as gas repla replacement for diesel in the trucking industry. It's cleaner and cheaper and relatively easy to adapt. Uh, and then they're also talking about gensets. They're talking about producing some electricity from gas for maybe you'll, in the future you'll see towns like Staddleton powered by gas-fired electricity. Now that's probably less than two years away from being available to South Africa's energy market. With 100 to 120 wells, they're talking about supplying 50 gigawatts of energy and they're saying, perhaps it's over-optimistic, at perhaps a 40% discount on current energy prices. Kinetico is now looking to acquire exploration rights in an even larger area southwestward in the Free State. Then there's shale gas. Oh, we all know this uh, shale gas is very um, controversial. Um, a lot of people reckon there's shale gas, gas in the Karoo, and this was very um, controversial, even amongst geologists. Um, but... Uh, the moment they started talking about it, there was a lot of green opposition and government imposed a moratorium that allowed the state to conduct what it called research on the baseline geology. And uh, it allowed for the evaluation of the resource. And in, this, in the words of the government, uh, to, to enable it to develop regulations to safeguard the environment. Now that's a belt across the Western, Eastern and Northern Cape. So in the meantime, the Council of Geoscience has drilled several boreholes, including that one that is about two and a half kilometers deep. They say they've found gas in commercially viable quantities and reckon there's around 8 trillion cubic feet of shale gas in the Beaufort West area alone. And in the whole of the Karoo, they're talking about 200 trillion cubic feet of gas. Now, they do admit that they're, they're not absolutely certain yet about how tightly the gas is, hold, is held, how easy it will be to take out with fracking, but nevertheless, it exists. However... It is, not, it is unlikely to be something that uh, is going to happen 
that quickly. I spoke to a guy involved in fracking um, recently, and he said even if he was, his company was allowed to frack tomorrow, it would take them six to seven years before they could produce commercially viable gas. So um, some people believe that South Africa may have missed the boat with fracking because we've had this 10-year hiatus um, from when people were first talking about it. But the one thing that 10-year delay has done is it's allowed fracking, and where it happens mostly in the United States, to develop a 10-year record. So we can look at 10 years of fracking and see what damage, if any, has been done to the environment. And the answer on that is very little, um, apart from some initial problems before they set proper safety and uh, safety standards. There was uh, some minor contamination of um, of, of surface water or of subsurface water, but uh, they've now sleeved those wells in concrete, and that's no longer a problem. So. What then could stand between the great potential of our oil and gas fields and, and uh, its transformation into an industry that provides cheap energy, jobs, and growth? Well, from my side, there are two threats, possible threats. First one is that government makes a hash of the legislation again. It did this before. In 2014, when they tried to write the uh, MPRDA, the Minerals and Petroleum Development uh, Act, um, they tried to shoehorn gas into it. And they basically made it up as they went along, and it was a complete mess. Uh, but after um, thinking about it for a couple of years, the ANC government realized that the dare may be right, and they needed separate pieces of legislation for oil and gas and for mining, which is what they've now done. And there's something called the Upstream Petroleum Development Act, which is currently before Parliament. And in two weeks, the Portfolio Committee starts sitting quite intensively to try and get that passed before the rising of Parliament and the next general election. So unless government is seized by another of its populist spasms of resource nationalism, and they try to extract more of a percentage than they're proposing in the current legislation, um, oil companies may, des may decide it's worth it. And within a couple of years, behind the Namibian schedule, we may be seeing big oil and gas developments off the coast. Um, there have also been suggestions that it could all be messed up by the ANC's relationship with the Russians. Um, there was a whisper that Total might not be so keen on drilling in South African waters because of South Africa's relationship with Russia. Um, in this case, the ANC's fondness for comrades who understand and share its extractive tendencies would put the whole industry at risk. Now, the second is, uh, potential threat is from Big Green. And by Big Green, I don't mean conservationists or real environmentalists. What I mean are the internationally funded anti-development brigade who reflexively oppose any development, whether it's mining or drilling. And it's these types of groups who take any drilling or seismic application to court and try and block it. They rely on poorly researched scare stories, which are spread under the guise of caring for the environment, but are essentially elitist concerns, which put the feel-good narratives of the rich ahead of the pressing need for us to pull 18 million South Africans out of poverty. South Africans need to decide whether they want development or not. If they do, it will be boosted by South Africa's endowment of minerals, which include fossil fuels, which have a major role to play in energy worldwide. Now, I think renewable energy has been oversold. We've heard a bit of that here this morning, but it is nevertheless with us to stay. And South Africa is also fortunate in it that it has a lot of the minerals needed for renewable energy. Um, a few mining conferences that I've been to recently have all echoed the same theme that the demand for these minerals is much, much greater than the current mining industry or even planned mines can supply. And there's another concern, a geopolitical concern, and that is that many of these minerals get refined in one place, and that is China. And uh, people are increasingly worried about that. I mean, if you look at the figures, China is the global leader in processing 73% of all cobalt, 40% of copper, 59% of lithium, 67% of nickel. People want to diversify that. So I'm going to hold out a rather fanciful um, idea, but one that I like a lot. Um, I've always been rather scornful of the whole idea of mineral beneficiation. People say, why don't we beneficiate our own minerals here at home? And the answer to that is, well, if it made financial sense, we would be. But of course it isn't. For one, we don't have electricity at the moment. But what if we did? What if we had, in 10 years, loads of cheap power which is one of the promises of this oil and gas energy endowment that we have. Could we not then also become a destination, not just for mining the minerals, but also for refining them there and adding even more to our economy? 
Either way, the world's going to be primarily powered by fossil fuels for a long time to come. And as South Africans, we can and should seize on the endowments we've been given to create a better future for all our countrymen. It's all out there. The game is worth playing. We should play it. Thank you.